Considering yeah. the amount of traffic and people and activity and stuff. Yeah, the reports again in regard to that great go in line with the, the historical reports that actually show that the uh scattered laws and all different things are so indeed we have been improving for eight ten years. So you saw if you look at the lake and it's cloudy and the lake is filthy. Not really from a scientific standpoint, that is the standpoint. It's actually not the So and, and it's our job for the people that live on the lake to take care of the lake. And and uh, a lot of things go with that, and you said and done, but there's, we've, got, we've got some presenters today that are also going to help um, talk about some other different things that are happening in the lake that we can also assist in. And so there's a lot of volunteer opportunities. Feel free, drop me a line, just sign in, take her over there, or shake a hand after, I'll get your contact info, and, and let her go from there. The, the year is just kicking off, there's a lot of time. So, again, thank you for your time. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Uh, our guest speaker is Prince. Alrighty. So uh, my presentation is really to uh, 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 to really hit home at the point that Steve's job is incredibly, incredibly difficult because uh, when it comes to managing aquatic weeds on a lake, uh, there's no there's no right way to do it. There's no wrong way to do it. Uh, because uh, uh, science doesn't doesn't like to work uh, in in black and white like that. Um, so, uh, uh, like Steve was saying, uh, lakes are dynamic, um, and the interactions that plants have uh, with the lake is dynamic, and it's really particular to every single lake. A uh, management plan for one lake is going to be completely different than the management plan for another. Um, Physicists have it easy uh, with their science. They get to have every action has an equal and opposite reaction, right? Um, when you study ecology, every action has an infinite number of reactions and an infinite number of triggers. <laughs> so we run into problems with that. Um, and that's why uh, 
what I really wanted to do for this presentation was uh, 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 describe some of the nuance uh, uh, that we have to take into consideration when we approach uh, talking about the mice that are in our lakes. Um, so, uh, exotic aquatics, an exploration of the invasive plants that threaten Michigan's waterways. Um, what is an invasive species is the first thing I'm going to hit, um, because before I trash talk these plants, I want to uh, uh, give a little context. So, uh, how do scientists define an invasive species? Uh, we use the word invasive, but uh, uh, we didn't start using that word for plants. We used that word for more. You know, it's a, it's a human word. It's, it's a word that describes uh, 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 problems that, we're happening between, that are happening between members of a single species. When we're talking about an invasive species, we're talking about a member of one species that is entering an, an alien world, uh, a world that is completely unlike uh, its native habitat. So uh, we don't want to use uh, these words like uh, cow knife, weedy, alien, pest, nuisance, noxious, non-indigenous. They all have a, a connotation, uh, a human emotional connotation. Uh, and that doesn't really work for science. Uh, according to scientists, this is what an invasive species is. This, this, uh, this chart here tells you what one is. And it's, uh, it doesn't, there's no emotion there. Um, it exists in either of those multiple stages. Um, and an invasive species isn't what we necessarily always think of. Uh, uh, we have uh, the, the willow tree from China, uh, for example. Uh, it's here, it's foreign. Uh, it didn't naturally grow in this environment. But uh, you don't see weeping willows taking over the roadways, you know, taking over the, the ditches in the side of the road because that's not how a weeping willow works, you know? So it might be a foreign species, but if it doesn't fit enough of our requirements, it's not actually going to be invasive or dangerous. Uh, in order for a species to be invasive and dangerous, you need to have that species come to a new area and then also have traits that make it dangerous in that area. Uh, things like propagule pressure, which is just a fancy way of saying, uh, does this species have a lot of things that are pushing it into new places? You know, um, and a weeping willow doesn't have propagule pressure. It doesn't, it's not releasing uh, loads of seeds that are going everywhere. In fact, all of weeping willows in America are males. Um, so it can't propagate like that. Um, but what we're dealing with, Things that are a problem on our lakes, uh, starry stonewort, um, Eurasian watermill foil. They exist in these stages. They've met enough requirements that not only are they foreign, but when they get here, they just have a ball. They love the conditions here. And there are, they, they existed for millions of years in their native habitat, growing alongside their native neighbors, right? Uh, and they got along with each other. They, they, they grew to a natural equilibrium, right? When something is transplanted, is transplanted to another environment and has the correct properties, uh, uh, but is not restricted by the by its original neighbors, then it can get really out of control. Uh, and that's what we see with Eurasian watermelon foil, with curly poppy, and with particularly starred stone. And that is what I'm going to talk about mostly: uh, is a tale of starry stone. And Ligorian, as we've already said, is well, well established as a species. Um, so, what is starry stonework? It comes from Europe, and this is I want to I want to I want to humanize it. I don't want to just talk about it as an invasive species that 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 is a problem, because where it's native, which is everywhere from Germany to Japan, it exists in very very small amounts. It's actually really rare, and it's considered an indicator of high water quality, which is which is fantastic. Um, and that's because in its native environment, it's kept in check by those things that have lived with it for a very, very long time. Um, and, it, and it has come from the same places that our secret mussels have come from, that the round gobies have come from, that the Eurasian water mill, mill foil has come from. Uh, and it's gotten here because it travels in ballast water. Um, so it can travel past the salty ocean by staying in ballast water. Uh, they've started to empty ballast water out the you don't always get what you want out of that. Um, so the issue is that uh, starry stonewort um, 
is uh, uh, unlike the Leaping Willow that I described earlier, Starry Stonewort has a lot of ways to propagate. Uh, Starry Stonewort, you can take a little fragment of it and be stuck to the bottom of your boat, right? Uh, and it gets stuck to the bottom of your boat, gets stuck to your prop in Lake Orion. Let's say you take your boat to uh, that pristine trout lake up north that only, that only you know about, you know, it's, it's the perfect place. Uh, if you get that little fragment of Starry Stonewort, and it rehydrates once you put uh, your boat in because you can wash your boat. Uh, you come back to that trout lake in five years and you don't have a trout lake. Um, and the Starry Stone is particularly, particularly in, insidious because of these guys right here, these bowl bills, as they're called. Uh, it's where Starry Stone gets its name. It's the only one that has these bowl bills that look like that. And these guys uh, bury themselves in the sediment and they can stay in the sediment for years. And even if you rip up all the stars, so if you if you go through the lengths and the money that it takes to rip up all of your star stonework um, through dredging, or they're actually there are ways that you can vacuum it, um, incredibly expensive. Uh, you're still going to end up with bubbles in your soil that are then going to give rise to a whole new generation of star stonework. Um, so we are dealing with a big problem with star stonework. It's it comes from another place, and it has all of the traits that it needs to thrive incredibly well here. So what are the consequences of this? Um, you may have seen conditions like this on your lake before. Uh, this is a pillowing starry stonewort. It's, it's supposed to be a deep species, right? And this has gotten its way all the way to the shore, because when starry stonewort, uh, it first it colonizes that really deep place that really there aren't any other native Michigan plants. Uh, they just don't grow that deep around here. Uh, one of the things that does grow that deep is Eurasian water milk foil. And ironically, lake managers have had a lot of success getting rid of their Eurasian water milk foil because our stoneware outcompetes it. Uh, it's just that much more delicious, which is incredible. Um, but starry stoneware has uh, uh, it's dangerous. Um, it's a physical hazard to boaters and swimmers. I don't know, on Lake Orion, have you ever uh, experienced uh, a chunk of starry stonework floating to the surface? Uh, it'll just get detached when it dies. Um, it's a hazard for, for boaters, for skiers. Uh, and when a single species dominates a lake like this, uh, it will collapse the ecosystem. You only have one species. Uh, I study food webs. And if you don't have diversity, in your, in, in your lake, if you don't have a lot of different species filling a lot of different holes, uh, your, your ecosystem is going to collapse. You know, your fish won't find the food that they need. They won't have the space that they need to, uh, uh, to, to mate and raise their young. You know? um, so, Star Stoneboard is uh, uh, it's very difficult. Um, but also, uh, uh, like, uh, like Steve said earlier, it actually increases the water clarity lake, um, superficially, you have better water quality. Um, but you also won't have any other species in starry stonework in your lake and you lose your fish. So these are the issues with starry stonework. And the management reality, like I said, Steve has a very, very difficult job. Um, they've done studies on how to manage starry stonework. Um, a combination of physical removal and chemical removal had the best impact but it couldn't get rid of the bubbles. Um, so the reality is that uh, when Starry Stonework is established in a place, at least for now, it's going to be there. Um, one of our solutions is we can wait 10,000 years, and then it will have evolved, uh, perhaps, to adapt to this environment. Uh, we can't wait that long. <laughs> you know, we don't have that kind of time. Um, so you can try to harvest it, you can try to vacuum it, you can use copper, um, you can use some other chemicals, but every management technique that you have, like I said, uh, you're not dealing with, you know, uh, uh, an action and an equal and opposite reaction, you're dealing with a million reactions. You put that chemical in, you're fixing your starry stonework problem in that particular area. You might kill some fish in that particular area. You might kill some of the cousins of Starry Stone that you want, like the care. Um, but you're also, uh, you might kill some of those, but you're still leaving space for more native plants to come in. So there's no, I can't say that management's good or that management's bad. 
management just needs to be intelligent and it needs to be informed. And from what it looks like, Steve, your lake manager, is doing the work. Uh, he's, he is trialing different, different management techniques and you will not know what works on your lake until you've done it on that particular lake because the, because the circumstances of every single lake is what, uh, uh, is what makes it different and what makes it very difficult to manage these plants. So um, now that I've talked about Starry Stonewort uh, and, and given you a kind of a breakdown of how these invasive species work, these are some of the other ones that I need to be on the lookout for. So Hydrilla. Hydrilla is not in Michigan yet. This is one species that hasn't been in Michigan yet. But it is, I believe, in either Indiana or Illinois, so it's coming. And it is an inevitability at this point. Uh, Hydrilla is, has done to uh, lakes throughout Florida and southeastern United States, uh, has, has done to those lakes what Starry Stonework has done to Lake Orion, uh, where it can fill the entire lake. Um, and you can identify it, it has these leaves in, in, in whorls of four or more and the leaves are serrated and have little teeth on the underside. Um, what is really, really important about hydrilla is early detection. We want to find it the minute that it gets into our state because when we can find it in small amounts, we have the best chance of getting rid of it. Once it's established, that's, that's when management becomes almost untenable. Curly leaf pondweed uh, has also been found in Lake Orion. Um, it has these tight lasagna-like curls, uh, finely serrated edges, and it grows much earlier than some of the other aquatic plants. Eurasian water leaf, this is the big one that most of you might have already heard of before. Uh, it has leaves in worlds before, it goes limp when you take it out of the water, and each leaf has more than 12 leaflets on either side. That's, that's how you identify it. It's already common in Michigan. It grows in deep waters. But it is occupied by starry stonework, um, and uh, 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 lake managers will actually selectively allow the growth of starry stonework and keep it below the surface of the water, but let it grow deep because it can push out the Asian water in the flow. And then finally, we have the European frog bit. Considering the wake conditions in Lake Orion, um, we're the least likely to find uh, uh, this guy. Um, it's a tiny, diamond quarter sized lily pad. It can't handle wave action, um, hardly at all. Uh, but this is a big guy that in very still lakes, it can come to dominate the entire lake. They don't want that. And here are some common healthy lookalikes that are species closely related to the invasive species that we're looking for. But they've lived here for a long time. They know how things work here. They don't disturb the natural equilibriums like our invasive species. So northern water milfoil looks like the Eurasian, but it has less than 10 leaflets on each leaf, and it's fluffy when it comes out of the water. You've likely seen the northern, you've likely seen the northern water milfoil. If you've looked in a fairly shallow area and you feel like you're seeing these green uh, Cheetos cheese puffs in the water, that's what your northern water milfoil is, and it won't look stringy like the Eurasian. Uh, Kara, um, Steve talked a lot about Kara. Um, that is a native cousin to the Scarlet Stonewort. Kara is also called Muskrats. It has this really, really, I love the smoke, I'm a hero, but uh, it has a really, really uh, uh, musky, garlicky sort of scent. And it's crunchy, it's crunchy, whereas uh, Starry Stonewort, if you pick it up, it'll pop in your fingers. Uh, so, and our final one is Alodia, which is the local cousin of Hydrilla. And Elodia, you're going to be able to tell from Hydrilla because it only has three leaves and there are no teeth under the leaves. And this is also called common water weed. Uh, you'll, see, you'll see a lot of it around. Um, so just, uh, if you see it, take a look. Um, you might be the lucky, or lucky is a relative term, but you might be the unlucky person to find Hydrilla and have an opportunity to make a difference by alerting someone who can which would be in your case, of course. So thank you for listening. Uh, that is all I had for you. I tried to condense it. I, I would have liked to get into the nuance a little bit more just because I'm a science guy, right? And I have a problem with my own community. 
in that they don't like to, uh, they don't know the least. They don't, they don't like to describe scientifically, um, they, they don't like to describe in scientific terms what they're looking at because they don't, they don't have enough faith in, uh, in the common public. And it's because the common public doesn't have enough faith in the scientific community these days. We're, we're running into problems with that. Uh, I want you to trust me when I'm talking about food webs because I know that I know about food webs. I want you to trust Steve when he's talking about management of the lake because he understands lake management. Um, we all have our specialties. And, uh, and that's something that we're being lost today. Uh, and so um, I wanted to show you that an invasive species, it's, it's not it, it, it's not the simple black and white thing uh, that, that we're used to hearing. An invasive species is that chart that I showed you. It's a, it's a nuanced concept. And uh, yeah, yeah, before we can ever make, um, uh, before we can ever find a solution to these problems, uh, sometimes the first step is accepting that there's not a simple solution in the first place. And then you can start to make realistic progress. So Nick, you and Mike teamed last year and got on the lake and yeah. you, in Mike's words, you said you visited about 15% of the lake. Yeah, and that's uh, one of the things that you had in your slides, you know, you guys were sniffing the weeds as they say. And uh, <laughs> yes. it's got the smell to it. So uh, what if what do you have for plans if any for this summer? Oh, so this summer, um, I, uh, uh, I'm working uh, with, the, with the Huron River Watershed Council again. They, they brought me back. Um, and I opened myself to all the lakes across Oakland County again um, to give them further technical support, uh, like I was able to do with Michael last year. Um, but I trained my volunteers too well last year. Uh, they, don't, they don't need me uh, all that much, um, which is a good thing um, for them, uh, a bad thing for me. Um, but uh, I do now have the opportunity to reach out to multiple lake associations and, uh, and actually spread the word because education and outreach is the most important uh, thing for, for these because the more people that know about an issue, uh, the more people you are reaching that might have a solution. You know, uh, uh, you, really, you really need people to know about something before, before they can take care of it. The scientific community wasn't paying any attention to Starry Stonewater uh, uh, until the last 10 years. Um, I have a book, where is that down? Yes. This book, Starry Stonewater, was given to me by the author. It's unpublished. Uh, and this is the, the most comprehensive understanding of Starry Stonewater that we have. But not a lot of people have access to it. it didn't, it's not on the internet, you know? And, and what we need is we need to connect people and ideas together um, in order to, to, to spread uh, awareness. Would that help with the management of Star Stormer? So yeah, yeah, which is like if if you if you had read this entire book, um, you might uh, uh, you know this would be a great resource for, for Steve and that you know maybe I should get Steve in touch with 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 uh, William because he you could, you could get him uh, absolutely yeah yeah, yeah because um, uh, uh, the more eyes that you get on any one topic, mm -hmm. the, the better off you are. So, so with regard to high growth, um, mm -hmm. what is, what's going on? Are there, are there efforts afoot to... So yeah, it is on, it's on every watch list. Anybody who is looking for exotic weeds in Michigan is looking for hydro. And that's what it comes down to. I, we, we want as many people who live on a lake as possible to be able to identify this guy and be able to distinguish it from a, a load of the native, because you're going to find that everywhere, you know? But we need as many people as possible to know what hydrilla looks like, so that the minute it's found, it can be taken out. Is that a shallow water or a deeper water? I'd have to do a little more research into that guy. I don't want to talk out of my, out of my area of expertise. Well, what I'm thinking, to drag your anchor off, and, you know, if you have enough knowledge about it, maybe you could identify it. Right. Yeah, yeah, and folks, uh, you can you can use your prop as a makeshift uh, when it when it happens. You'll you'll see what we have got in there. Um, Michael has a rake that he that he built, um, and we can get you instructions for those. Uh, and those help us out. Uh, so you can take a look even just around your own dock if you have a rake. You can you can take a few poles just just from the side of your dock, um, and with with the right materials, which are all over. Uh, 
livecore.net. All those, all those materials are, are available for you. Um, it'll have instructions on how to build a sampling rig. It'll have instructions to teach you how to identify all of the invasive plants. Um, and then uh, 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 it'll also give you resources on how to contact people like myself who uh, uh, can give you a one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one technical assistance if that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I wish everyone on the lake should be forced to look at this part of the lake. Like, you want to buy this house on the lake? You, you, gotta, you have to watch this sentence. <laughs> yeah. Look, look for these certain guys because it's that important. Yeah, if we had environmental education, you know, uh, uh, it's just um, if that were just as important of a rule as your zoning rules, you know, you would see you would see huge changes in this kind of stuff. But it just takes people to know. You know? Well, yeah, unfortunately, people don't want to do nothing. They really start taking it away until their legs start disappearing. Oh, what's going on? You know, I need to get up to speed here. Can I have this part? Can you just send it to me before? Absolutely, absolutely. All no, the pictures were great. I mean, everything was really. I mean, I want to print it out just for myself. It's you know, it's really Very good. Well. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, and there are materials on my board that go even more into more detail yeah. just about the pieces. So, yeah. Well, yeah, thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.